This is the Evening News, Wednesday, February 12, 2014. I'm Michael Young. Thanks for joining us. Making the headlines tonight. Medical reports prove that Colwyn Hardin was raped. Opposition concerned with Guyanese linkage to mafias. Local government elections not possible by August 1, says GCOM. £444 of contaminated beef seized. APNU demotes Kisun to backbencher. And Guyana scores low in press freedom index. Now for the news in detail. Two independent medical reports conducted on Colwyn Hardin proved that he was raped using a foreign object which ruptured his rectum. Details from Samuel Suknanden. The Colwyn Hardin support group today revealed the results of two independent medical reports which indicate that there is now enough evidence to claim that a policeman sodomized Hardin with a baton. Hardin's attorney Nigel Yu said that a medical expert found that there was active rectal mucosa bleeding in Hardin's upper rectum which proves that a foreign object was used to rape him. You can take it away, the upper rectum is located here and you will see from the diagram that any foreign object that goes in here, this is where uh, Mr. Harding was found still to be bleeding on the 21st of January 2014 after he had been discharged from the public hospital. A local medical expert performed an examination on Harding on January 25, 2014 at the St. Joseph's Mercy Hospital. While doctors in Jamaica said the Guyanese doctors could not have formed an opinion because they had not examined Harding. You said the findings of both medical reports have been dispatched to the Director of Public Prosecution, Bibi Shalimar Alihak, for her to consider possible charges to be instituted on the police officer involved. But the, the important report is the one that was done before he left, mm -hmm. uh, which was done by the independent medical expert. Um, we will certainly share that with the Director of Public Prosecution for the report um, that, that I think is of, 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 of greater weight in the circumstances, like proximity to the event, proximity to the time of discharge is the report by the independent medical expert and that is the one that found there was still active bleeding then. A claim of $100 million has been made to the police commissioner while Hughes has also written the Attorney General Anil Nandalal to discuss the matter of damages. During the press conference today, the man's mother Sharon Harding broke down in tears as Hughes explained to media operatives the severity of damage this incident has caused Kowlin Harding and on his entire health. Harden is due for her next surgery to repair the damages made to his anus in another six to eight weeks, which is likely to be performed in Jamaica. The family, however, needs U.S. $7,500 to offset all of the expenses, including the entire surgery. Persons wishing to support Calvin Harden and his family are therefore asked to contact Red Thread Director Karen D'Souza on telephone numbers 227-7010 or 223-6254 to make a financial contribution. For the Evening News, I'm Samuel Suknanden. Thanks, Bisham. Members of the Partnership for National Unity this morning met with Chief of Staff Mark Phillips in light of extremely grave reports about linkages between Guyanese narco-traffickers and Italian mafia to lend support to their technical departments in order to get rid of drug traffickers in Guyana. Hear more details from Bisham Mohamed. Moments after leaving Camp Aingana this morning, opposition leader David Granger says the situation is one that requires immediate and forceful reaction on the part of the government of Guyana. We felt that this is a situation that requires immediate and forceful reaction by the part of the Guyana government. And we met this morning with the chief of staff and the senior officers to call attention to the gravity of the situation and to give support to the Defence Force in filling a void that is open in the national narco, uh, narco, the national anti-narcotic strategy. We are aware of the fact that there is now no valid national drug strategy master plan. Everyone knew that when it expired in 2009, it would have had to be replaced. And there is no justification for waiting five years for its replacement. We feel that it is because of the absence of a national drug strategy master plan that cocaine trafficking continues to take place in Guyana. Granger recalled the 2000-2008 period when well-known international narco-traffickers brought sophisticated weapons which led to the demise of several Guyanese in Buxton, Lusignan and Bartica and would not want to see a recurrence. 
We are calling on the GDF, we spoke to Brigadier Mark Phillips, the Chief of Staff, to let us know in the National Assembly what help we can give to strengthen the technical core, the technical arms of the Guyan Defence Force, particularly aviation, Coast Guard and land assets so that we can interdict narcotics and guns coming into this country. We are aware that narcotics, traffic, uh, narcotics are coming into this country by the plane load, but only small couriers carrying a few grams are being arrested. But we can see from the report in the international newspapers that cocaine is leaving here in large volumes, in fish, in pineapples, in wood and other products. Meanwhile, Home Affairs Minister Clement Rohe said that he is waiting on additional information with respect to the recent development, noting that if there are indeed Guyanese linkages to Italian mafias, the Guyana government will join with the U.S. authorities in dismantling any such ring. Bisham Mohammed, The Evening News. Commissioner of Information Charles Ramson Sr. says that while the opposition seems to be concerned over his monthly income, he believes that he deserves way more than $1.2 million as a gross salary. Samuel Subnandan tells us why in this report. Justice Charles Ramson says that while there has been some anxiety among members of the opposition about his monthly income as the sitting Commissioner of Information, he believes that he should have been paid more. Ramson told this newscast that he is not at all troubled by the comments made by opposition members regarding neither his salary nor the work of the Commission. This is especially since he believes that the salary is somewhat inadequate for the post he holds, and the work of the Commission is also moving apace. It's not very... Uh, welcoming for people to be making remarks about salary and allowances. In fact, I could claim to be underpaid because I, if I had remained the Attorney General, my salary would have been much larger than it is and it would have been tax free. This is subject to tax and I don't have the other benefits. The Commissioner of Information believes that had he been in private practice as an attorney, he would have made way more than what he is currently working for. He said that he was called out of retirement to serve and he will do exactly that. I can tell you I received an electronic disc in response to the questions that have been asked in relation to moving the ball from one part of the court to the next. And that I'm now writing, I received it yesterday, although I requested it since August, the information. But clearly the person misunderstands the inquiry that I made. So I'm now writing the person to indicate that this is good for archival purposes. It's not going to move the ball from one point to the next. And hopefully he will respond in a responsible manner. In providing an update on the work of the Commission, Justice Ramson said that while no reports are in receipt of the Commission, he believes that work for the Commission will kick start very soon. Imperceptibly, we have been making a lot of progress. But it takes time because it's so, such a new dispensation. It's nothing like it was before. It hasn't removed the ministries or the other agencies from giving access to the information to the public. It has added a next tier, that is the commissioner is responsible to ensure that those agencies deal fairly with requests from members of the public. Based on a request from Alliance for Change Member of Parliament, Kathy Hughes, it was revealed that Justice Charles Ramson Sr. works for a monthly net income of $1.2 million. Today, the Commission has not received an application. Justice Ramson was sworn in as Commissioner of Information on July 15 last year. He is a former Attorney General and Legal Affairs Minister. The Freedom of Information Act was passed in September of 2011. For the Evening News, I'm Samuel Suknandan. 
Police have launched a manhunt for two suspects who they believe are responsible for breaking into Jackie's fashion, located at Lot 26 Public Road, Grove, East Bank, Demerara, and carting off items and cash to the tune of $3 million between Tuesday evening and this morning. Based on reports received, a window to the northern side of the two-story business was found opened on Wednesday morning about 6.30 hours by the landlord who immediately contacted his tenants. After checking were made in the presence of the police, it was discovered that $254,000, which was hid in a drawer, was missing, along with laptops, a DVR player, and a quantity of fashionable clothing and other items. The bandits reportedly gained entry into the business by wrenching open the window and by breaking the grill that served as protection. On Tuesday, some 444 pounds of beef that came from a cow that drowned was seized by the officers of the Food and Hygiene Department. More details in this report. Officers of the Food Hygiene Department on Tuesday seized some 444 pounds of beef that was salvaged from a cow that reportedly drowned. According to reports, the officers acted on information received and paid an unexpected visit to Rahman's Meat Center in James Street, Albaistong, where the discovery was made. An inspection of the storage facility of the meat center uncovered that a quantity of uninspected beef and visually contaminated beef was in the freezers. The beef reportedly was covered in feces and grass. The operators of the meat center, Junior Rahman and Theodia Holder, were questioned and subsequently revealed that the meat was Ill indeed illegally obtained. Investigations later revealed that the cow from which the beef was obtained belonged to Chandra Kishore. The meat was taken to the municipal abattoir where it was destroyed. The offenders, Rahman and Holder, are likely to be prosecuted or sanctioned in connection with the act. Bisham Mohammed, the Evening News. This is TVG's Evening News. More details after these messages. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're tuned to the evening news. Guyana Elections Commission is in no position to host local government elections by August 1. This is according to GCOM's public relations officer, Vishnu Basod. Sadlana Marshall reports. In the National Assembly, a partnership for national unity, APNU, and the Alliance for Change, AFC, amended the local authorities' elections amendment bill 2014 to have local government elections held by August 1. The amendments were passed without the support of the ruling People's Progressive Party Civic, PPPC, which stated clearly that the local government elections is not possible by the date set. But this is not only the view of the PPPC, but the Ghana Elections Commission, GCOM. GCOM's public relations officer, Vishnu Prasad, said while the Secretariat has plans in place for the staging of local government elections, it is in no position to hold elections by August 1. He said a period of six months is required to be fully prepared for a successful election. When the Local Authorities' Elections Amendment Bill 2014 was presented in the House on Monday, it was the intention of the Local Government Minister, Norman Whitaker to have the elections postponed for 2014. Initially, the election was scheduled to be held before December 1. However, the Minister contradicted himself. Mr. Speaker, the Guyanese people have heard ad nauseum the various reasons for the delay in holding local government elections. But the truth, the truth is that the key legislative reform for such elections have been passed in the National Assembly and assented to by His Excellency. But we are hearing different signals coming from the other side. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, we ought to be aware, we must be aware that several clauses of the Local Government Amendment Bill of 2013, as amended by the opposition, go beyond the expectations 
explicitly set out in the Constitution of Guyana. Whitaker argued that both the government and the opposition should work to move the process forward in the staging of the local government elections. He stated that the required legislations are in place for the holding of elections, but it was on this same note he called for the elections to be postponed. I call on the parliamentary opposition political parties to support the local authorities elections amendment bill 2014 and agree to a postponement of the overdue elections while we work collectively to conclude proper preparations for the holding of these elections on or before December 31st, 2014. But APNU Ronald Bolkan, the opposition's shadow local government minister, wasted no time in bashing Whitaker over his contradictory arguments in the House. The Honorable Minister accused the opposition of opposing and obstructing the process that is necessary for the holding of these elections. And having leveled that accusation against the opposition, the minister went on to say that it's time to move forward. Time to move forward. And whilst, as the minister said, that we are now closer to the desired result, the, the desire results, the minister invites us to be a part of this process in supporting this bill. Well, Mr. Speaker, the fact remains that this bill it provides for the postponement of elections, not the holding of elections. So I think the minister should make up his mind. It was Attorney General and Legal Affairs Minister Anil Nanlal who rose to the defense of the junior local government minister, stating the GCOM was not prepared for the hosting of elections. This, he said, is an undisputed fact. According to him, the PPP-nominated commissioners of the Elections Commission have all explained that it was not ready for elections unless a number of undertakings occur. Nevertheless, the opposition used its one-seat majority to amend the bill for the holding of local government elections to be held by August 1. It was last held in 1994. Members of the National Assembly on Monday evening supported a motion in the name of Chairman of the Appointive Committee, Dr. George Norton, to add a new group to the structure of the Ethnic Relations Commission. Samuel Supnandan reports. Both sides of the House voted to have the motion passed. The new group will be referred to as Culture Ethnic and will see nominations being made from a list of 183 NGOs working in ethnic and religious areas. Three nominees will be elected to serve on the ERC through the National Assembly. The ERC had comprised representatives from seven different constituencies. The new group will now contain the three main ethnic groups, Indian, African and Amerindian, that will each nominate one person. The number of commissioners for the ERC will now move from 7 to 10. The committee seeks the approval of this National Assembly for the consensual mechanism for the nomination of members of the entities as was set out in the second schedule that is in the report. The committee agreed that a motion as well as a report should be tabled in the National Assembly. Hence, this motion and report is accordingly hereby moved. Meanwhile, People's Progressive Party Civic PPPC frontbencher and Agriculture Minister Dr. Les Ramsamy said that the government supports the motion. Dr. Ramsamy, who had served as a member of the appointive committee once, said that he is pleased with the progress made, especially since it opened up avenues for more NGOs to participate. I would urge that we move uh, to the next stage, endorse this motion, have the nominations made as rapidly as possible, and appoint the members of the commission as soon as possible. But once again, Mr. Speaker, we'd like to support the motion as moved by the Honorable Member. PPPC Chief Whip Gail Teixeira said that she supports the change in the structure of the ERC. Teixeira noted that while the inclusion of many organizations is good, the fact that the committee also sought to add new NGOs that are credible is even greater achievement. And I think this is a very important achievement that we are making here tonight. And, um, but I also want to caution that we have the Women and Gender Equality Commission, the rights of the child expired 
the service commissions have expired all within 2013. And we need to have the Committee of Appointment address these plus in the, some of the legislation, including <coughs> the one that was raised by Mr. Williams earlier tonight, with the Local Government Commission, the Committee of Appointment plays a role in there as well. So that we have a lot of work to do this year, and I hope that this is the beginning of 2014, that we will be able to work in the same manner we were able to work on the ERC in 2013. Alliance for Change AFC Member of Parliament Valerie Garidolo also expressed support for the motion. The AFC Member of Parliament explained that the task was a tedious one. Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the Alliance for Change, I rise in support of the motion carried in the name of the Honorable Member Dr. George Norton, Chairman of the Committee of Appointments, to increase the number of members appointed to the Ethnic Relations Commission from seven to ten members and to include a new category, cultural ethnic, with a right to have three members being one representative each of the three largest ethnic groups and the list of entities on the attached first schedule in accordance with Article 212 1AB. The ERC has been functioning without commissioners and a chairman for some time. While staff is attached to the commission, there is little known about the work they are doing. The opposition during the 2012 and 2013 national budgets had cut funding for the constitutional body, but this was later restored through a court order. The ERC is a constitutional body established under the Hardmanston Accord. For the Evening News, I'm Samuel Suknandan. A partnership for national unity, Sydney Alicock, petitioned the National Assembly for the Letham Power Company Incorporated in Region 9 to rescind its recent decision to hike electricity tariffs. Hear more details from Swetlana Marshall. Let Empower Company Incorporated in January 2014 increased its electricity tariff to $75 per kilowatt. But a petition signed by more than 300 residents in Region 9 indicates their non support for this imposition. Representing the people of Region 9 in the National Assembly, a partnership for National Unity member Sidney Alicock asked that the petition be read. He told the House that the increase comes at a time when the power company is poorly managed its resources across the board persons have been paying one rate what we are asking is that the different levels of payments be made and uh, it is to think about the poor people to think about those who just work for say forty thousand dollars a month as against those who work for say a million dollars a day without any objections the petition was read by clerk of the national assembly sherlock isaacs according to the petition since 1995 the power company has instituted increases with residents respectfully accepting the increases following consultations but this time around it is alleged that no consultation took place the last tariff was decided as follows. The first 15 kW free, the next 30 kW, $45 per kW, any consumption above that $55 per kW. And whereas these decisions were sanctioned by the Honorable Prime Minister of Guyana, who informed residents that according to a recent study, it was discovered that the minimum electricity any household should use is 45 kV, kW. And whereas during the first week of January 2014, residents received a letter from the LMPCI informing that the tariff will be increased to $75 per kW with effect from 1st January 2014. Prime Minister Samuel Hang said considering Letten's potential, the government of Ghana directed a grant of approximately $700 million to install a Mokomoko Hydro in 1999. However, the Mokomoko Hydro suffered a massive failure due to the landslide in 2004. Since then, he said electricity in Letem and neighboring communities is supplied through diesel generation. He told the House that the government has been putting systems in place to ensure 
live at communities served by the company receive 24 hours of electricity. However, the operating costs largely carried by the government has increased. I am for the people in the rest of Region 9 that we should advance electrification. And I and Aranaputa, I can sense that they want 24-7 uh, electricity. I shelter Karasabai. Those are places that can grow, where economy can grow. But we cannot, as we grow, grow on the Treasury by imposing greater and greater burdens on the Treasury. We cannot base our expectation on early times that are referred to in this 1995 and previous, when there was a supply in Lethem not metered to maybe a hundred, if so many, government buildings and government officers. He also refuted claims that no consultation took place before the new tariffs were imposed, stating that he visited Region 9 twice in 2013 to address residents on the increase and all the issues. On both occasions, he said residents agreed that the increase was necessary. A partnership for national unity did not inform long-standing parliamentarian Vanessa Kisun ahead of Monday's sitting of the National Assembly that she was demoted and her seating arrangements changed within the opposition coalition group. As a matter of fact, Kisun confirmed being only informed upon her arrival at parliament buildings at noon. The news caught her off guard, it would appear. Speaking with this newscast on Tuesday evening from her home in Linden, Region 10, Kisun explained that no reasons were proffered by the APN News Chief Whip Amna Ali or its chairman David Granger for the decision to make her a backbencher. She said that she did not inquire either at the moment as it did not appear important to her as there were more pertinent matters to be addressed during Monday's sitting which required her attention. Kisun, who was appointed a member of parliament back in 2006 on the People's National Congress Reform won Guyana's platform, said that she was in the National Assembly to serve the people of Guyana and represent those who elected her in Region 10. Before I begin on this bill, I'd like to take some time to warmly welcome the new member, Dr. Cummings, to the House. There's a good place where much can be done if the environment is right. And I hope it'll be right for you because I believe uh, when women are in positions of leadership, we can influence good change. And so I, have, uh, I am very pleased that you have joined us and that you are here with us this evening. I do want to also offer congratulations to my learned friend, Mr. Basil Williams. I am very fond of Mr. Williams and I'm very, very pleased and feel a sense of pride that my friend that I've known for many years has uh, been elevated into this office. And so I do wish him all the very best and, and warm congratulations. I do have to say though, sir, that it would be dishonest of me if I didn't say that I'm saddened by the fact that we have, we missed an opportunity, I say we very loosely because this side of the house had very little to do with who was going to be elevated into that office of deputy speaker. And I'm, I'm disappointed that the opposition missed the opportunity to demonstrate their belief in equality and their professed uh, desire to see women empowered by not replacing the deputy speaker, the former deputy speaker of with a uh, woman and so now we've broken this beautiful tradition that we had where at least the deputy speaker was female and we now have a mr deputy speaker which jarred my ears just now when your honor referred to mr williams as mr and i do have to note sir that i'm i'm further distressed by a new configuration that i've seen on this side of the house on the opposition side where i've seen and this speaks to where I've seen uh, another male, probably a very good sound male, elevated to the front bench, but a woman placed far behind where she was before and should have been. 
and that causes me worry. For the persons who are myopically saying, sir, that I should concern myself with this side of the house, I'd like to suggest that the... the <laughs> Women in Guyana, the cause of women across the world still has to be a united cause because it is far from being met. The desires, the things that we should have for equality and true equality are far from being met. And every little demotion like we've seen here today really dents our progress as a gender. This is the evening news. Join us after these messages for more news. Welcome back. This is the Evening News and TVG Channel 28. President Donald Ramadar said the long-awaited establishment of the Walter Rodney Commission of Inquiry will soon come on stream. Alexis Rodney joins us with details. President Ramatarban contacted earlier today said that he was unable to relay any information at that point. He said that a lot of work has already been done and that the body responsible for the commission still has a few small matters to deal with. However, he stressed that these issues will soon be worked out, making way for the setting up of the Inquiry Commission. Last week, Working People's Alliance's Rupert Rupnerine had said that the organization was still awaiting action from the head of state with regards to the establishment of the Inquiry Commission. Rupnerine said that since the revelation was made last year in New York by President Ramatar, the organization is yet to hear from the officials. Rodney was killed on June 13, 1980, while he sat in a car outside the Georgetown prison. It is alleged that ex-Army electronics expert Sergeant Gregory Smith planted a bomb that killed the political activist. It is also alleged that officials from the then Burnham government was responsible for his death, a claim that has been denied by the PNC. Findings from the Inquiry Commission, it is hoped, will determine the truth. For the Evening News, I'm Alexis Rodney. It's now time for a break. More news after these messages. Welcome back. The Ghana Tourism Authority, in collaboration with the North Rupununi District Development Board, facilitated a two-day first aid training for tour guides at Bina Hill, Anai Region 9. The training, which was conducted on February 8 and 9, 2014, was conducted by Retalian Evelyn of St. John's Ambulance Brigade. Four to three tour guides from nearby villages and lodges participated in the training session, which touched on topics such as burns, bleeding, sprains, strain heart attacks, choking and unconsciousness, as well as fractures, among others. Guides also participated in practical sessions conducting CPR and demonstrating techniques on tying a sling for fractures. The objective of this training program was to ensure that registered guides are capable of providing first aid assistance to visitors and tourists in the event of any emergency while conducting tours. Guyana is well below its CARICOM neighbors when the scores of the World Press Freedom Index were released today. Details in this story. For the second year running, Guyana has remained in the bottom rank of its fellow CARICOM countries with a measly score of 67 out of 180. The Press Freedom Index is a reference to how well media operatives in various countries are allowed to carry out their duties without fear of interference of any kind. It uses seven criteria to assess countries. The level of abuses, the extent of pluralism, media independence, the environment and self-censorship, the legislative framework, transparency and infrastructure. Contributing to Guyana's low ranking on the index is the fact that the Access to Information Act has not been activated. 
there is a huge controversy over allocation of broadcast frequencies, the accusation against government for unwarranted verbal attack on media practitioners, along with being accused of using state advertisement to punish perceived critics. Jamaica was the best-ranked country with a score of 17, followed by Belize, who appeared for the first time in the index with a rank of 29. Suriname had a rank of 31, Antigua and Barbuda at 36, Trinidad and Tobago with 43, and Haiti at 47. Bisha Mohammed, the Evening News. Natural Resources and the Environment Minister Robert Passaud has called on miners to declare every ounce of gold, noting that this move will tremendously benefit the people of Guyana. Svetlana Marshall reports. Natural Resources and the Environment Minister Robert Passaud said the Guyana Geology and Mines Commission, the Guyana Gold Board and the Guyana Gold and Diamond Miners Association continue to receive complaints about the smuggling of gold. In 2013, Guyana experienced a 10% increase in gold decoration. However, the minister strongly believes that more gold could have been declared. We seek to declare nearly on, in fact, every single ounce of gold that is produced in this country. Because we continue to receive reports within the Guyanese community and even <coughs> our um, allies outside of Guyana about reports and allegations of smuggling. And I want to, and, I'm, and it is my nature, I like to throw and confront the problems up front. And I want to encourage, and I know the GGDME has been very firm in this, but I want to encourage all others, whatever influence you have, to ensure that every single ounce is declared because that is how the people of Ghana benefit. In addition to gold, Prasad said his ministry will be working to expand the sector, thereby exploring the possibility of mining other minerals. This move will complement the mining of gold, diamond, bauxite and sand. We are not only see continued growth, but our emphasis is on expanded growth as well as diversification uh, because of the unstable and the unpredictable nature of minerals, commodities as a whole, we need to diversify. We need to ensure that the wide range of potential resources that we have are fully developed, fully utilized, but also doing so in harmony with our environment as well as our social obligations. The Natural Resources Minister at the time was speaking at a reception held at a 704 Sports Bar to welcome GGMC new chairman Clinton Williams. Williams said he is prepared to serve the people of the mining sector. We have to continue to ensure as Dr. Bango said, make this particular industry significant in terms of contribution to our gross domestic product, foreign exchange earnings and therefore stabilizing our economy. And so my role as chairman of the board has been defined for me even before I came here. Um, we're working on interventions, hopefully, that we can introduce into the sector that will give us that kind of confidence that we will continue to make this sector an efficient and productive one. Chairman of the Guyana Gold Board, Gobin Ganga, recently confirmed Commissioner of GGMC, Rick Ford Vera, and President of the Guyana Gold and Diamond Miners Association, Patrick Hardin, were among officials present at the reception held recently. Reporting for the Evening News, I'm Swatlana Marshall. Please stay with us. More news still ahead. Welcome back you to the evening news. Home Affairs Minister Clement Rohe said that those agencies tasked with data collection on drug-related issues should dig deeper into social factors in order to get more accurate and in-depth information. Details in this report. The Home Affairs Minister made this comment at the opening ceremony of the Inter-American Drug Abuse Control Commission, CCAD, seminar today at the Police Training Center. Rohi pointed out that the methodologies used to gather data, if not consistent with the culture and tradition of a country, then that information gathered will be flawed. So I think the data collection exercise, as we examine it carefully, especially from the technical perspective, must take into consideration certain 
national peculiarities. What may be relevant in one country may not be relevant in another. This doesn't mean to say, however, there shouldn't, shouldn't be certain uh, uh, principles that guide the whole subject of data collection, the ways and means of standardizing the data collection and placing them in a system that is common across the region. Also present at the opening ceremony of the seminar were several representatives from the Organization of American States and CARICOM. OAS representative Jean Rico Dominus lauded the government for hosting this seminar, which he said will boost its fight in drug and alcohol abuse. I believe this workshop will equip you to improve your approach to drug and alcohol treatment. That alone is a significant contribution to the development of our countries. Meanwhile, former Chief of Staff Michael Atherley highlighted that the changing social and economic climate, coupled with increased availability and promotion of drugs and their demands, have contributed to the magnitude of the global drug abuse issues and associated societal ills. There has been an increase in the social and economic factors which make people, especially young people, more vulnerable and likely to engage in drug use and drug-related risk-taking behavior. Extensive efforts have been and continue to be made by governments of the region to su suppress the illicit production, use, and trafficking of drugs. The CCAT seminar is being hosted by the OAS in collaboration with the Ministry of Home Affairs under the theme Implementing a Standardized Data Collection System for Drug and Alcohol Treatment Agencies in the Caribbean. Reporting for the Evening News, Vanu Manikchan. Three charities today received cash donations from the Ghana Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Here are details in this story. As part of its Harvest in Gathering campaign 2014, the Guiana Conference of Seventh-day Adventists today handed over checks valued over $450,000 to three charities in Guyana. Director of Community Services for the organization, Pastor Jumal Sancho, said the monies being donated to the charities were donated to the organization during the past year. This campaign referred to as the Harvest and Gathering campaign is present in just about every place where you find Seventh-day Adventist, Seventh Adventism. And it has been in operation for over 100 years. This, during this six weeks house-to-house -house solicitation period, members of our church go around in the community, as the president said, we identify needs in the community we record those needs and we plan to follow up with these families. The name of the solicitor should be on top. Authorized solicitors go around with a card. Their names are recorded on top. There's a signature of the regional uh, coordinator, the treasurer of the union. And also at the bottom should be the signature of the solicitor. Pastor Sancho added, through the year, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, through their congregations countrywide, conducted several humanitarian outreaches. He added that the church spends some $2 million each year to facilitate such programs. The three charities, Dharamshala, Kamal's Home for Battered Women and Children, and the PUSH Project, which comes under the Davis Memorial Hospital, all expressed earnest gratitude for the donation made by the organization. Join us on the other side of the break for your sport news.
Welcome back to the Evening News. It's now time for a look at what's happening in the world of sport. But first, your headlines. Guyana square off with Barbados in second Nagigo Super 50 semi-final tomorrow. Anson McCall made a monetary presentation to the Guyana Boxing Association. And Young Tiger roars in second warm-up win. Just a reminder, our sports cast is brought to you with the kind compliments of Makor. We believe that everything worth building should be built just once. But that is why we build on culture, on trust, on integrity. We exist to do more, better, faster, safer. Your success depends on the foundation it's built on. Everything we do is meant to move you forward. Marco, let's build Guyana together. Welcome back. This is the Evening News Sport. Guyana will face a confident Barbados in the second semi-finals of their Nagigo Super 50 competition at the Queen's Park Oval tomorrow. It would be a contest on even keel as both teams would do everything in their power to reach Saturday's final. Barbados booked their place in the semis by topping Zone B, while Guyana ended Zone A as runner-ups. The game is a day-night encounter and will start at 1400 hours. The winner will face either host Trinidad and Tobago or Jamaica in Saturday's final. Tej Narayan Chantrapal compiled a powerful half-century to guide West Indies to a comfortable six-wicket win over New Zealand in a warm-up match on Wednesday before the start of their campaign in the ICC Under-19 World Cup in Dubai on Friday. Chantrapal rekindled the innings with a top score of 6-2, allowing West Indies to overhaul the 147 scored by New Zealand. The young cricketers from the Caribbean stumbled to seven for the loss of two quick wickets within three balls in the the third over after opener Shemron Hetimaya was caught for two and Nicholas Puran was also caught without scoring. But the son of the famous West Indies batsman Shifna Ryan struck seven fours and brought his side back on course, featuring in two half century partnerships before he was forced to retire hurt. Boxing received a shot in the arm today when Anson McCall made a monetary presentation to the Ghana Boxing Association for their upcoming Goodwill Boxing Tournament. Tristan Joseph reports. Marketing Director of Anson McCall presented a check for an undisclosed sum of money to aid the GBA in their hosting of the Goodwill Boxing Championships featuring Trinidad and Tobago, St. Lucia and Jamaica. Cadogan also noted that the event can be just what the Guyanese boxers need to achieve greatness at the highest level. And Anson McCall being the corporate citizen that they are, um, is pleased to support boxing. Um, boxing is one of the pillars of um, some of one of our brands. Um, we would have um, sponsored the first or the inaugural international box off where we get some money over last year and we'll be doing um, this year. Um, this series of events is in preparation for the 2016 Olympics and we hope that this small gesture um, will help our athletes in realizing that long, elusive gold medal. President of the GBA, Steve Ninval, was pleased for the support shown by the leading beverage company. This shot in the arm is really needed because, as Mr. Cadogan said, it's quite an ex expensive task to bring these guys in, to house them and to feed them. And some of this sponsorship will go into our encampment. We have 14 boxes encamped at the National Gymnasium and they are rearing to go. And, and you know, it is only right that uh, we ask the boxing community to support the people who support boxing. So we call on the boxing community to support Anson McCall and Anson McCall products. The overseas boxers will be arriving tomorrow for the championships that begin on Friday at the Cliff Anderson Sports Hall. The Ghana Rotary Club of New Amsterdam will host an exciting day of T20 cricket on February 16 at the Cumberland Ground in Kanji. The one-day event will feature Albion Cricket Club, Rosehall Tongue Youth and Sports Club, Young Warriors, the Edward Cricket Club, West Side, with action set to commence from 900 hours. The event is being hosted as a fundraiser charity game to raise funds for the club's programs for 2014, which include a number of community-related projects. 
projects. Meanwhile, after the T20 fiesta, patrons will have the opportunity to witness a live band together with a car and bike showdown where auto owners uh, can compete for the titles of best sound, cleanest vehicle, best graphics and antique rides. Entrance fee is $200 and persons will be allowed, of course, to have lots of fun. Do stay with us. Your Bridge Reports are next. We believe that everything worth building should be built just once. But that is why we build on culture, on trust, on integrity. We exist to do more, better, faster, safer. Your success depends on the foundation it's built on. Everything we do is meant to move you forward. Marco, let's build Guyana together. Welcome back to the Evening News. It's now time for a look at your bridge reports. The Demerara Harbour Bridge will be closed on Thursday, February 13th at 14 hours 30 for a period of one and a half hours. The Burbies River Bridge will be closed on Thursday, February 13th at 16 hours 55 for a period of one and a half hours. That's your Wednesday, February 12th edition of the Evening News. I'm Michael Young, thanking you very much for joining us and encouraging you to do join us at 7 hours tomorrow morning for a look at TVG's Morning News. Goodbye.